Hi everyone, it's Jerry. This is Game 2 from the 2016 World Chess Championship match between Sergei Karyakin, challenger, playing on the white end, and our current champion Magnus Carlsen. Going into Game 2, this match is level. They drew in Game 1, so let's see who would blink first. Karyakin opens with e4, Carlsen replying with e5, a much more popular opening for this game too. Roy Lopez. Let's see how play follows. Getting some standard moves in. We have a closed system of the Roy. Black grabs some queenside space. After e5 is defended with a pawn, that means the knight on c6 doesn't have a defensive responsibility. He's now prepared to hunt down the bishop. That's why we now have a3 preparing to run away. You can also see c3 at this point doing similar and preparing a central expansion. In this game, it's a3, castles, knight c3, knight a5 still. Now, isn't the bishop just as satisfied being on a2 than he is on b3? I mean... Isn't he performing the same main function, namely to patrol the a2 to g8 diagonal? The answer to that is yes. So really the big question is why knight a5? What is gained? Well, this e-pawn is now free to move to maybe c6, maybe c5. c6 to strike at a possibly a white pawn on d5, that could happen, or maybe c5 to increase some pressure on a white pawn if it goes to d4. The c pawn is free. That's the main point. Bishop e6 challenges a very strong white piece. Bishop on a2 is very good, so bishop e6 develops. Challenges that piece, d4, e5 is struck at twice, bishop takes bishop, rook takes bishop. This rook is inconvenienced. He would much rather be on a2, or excuse me, a1 in the corner, or has more options. It could swing over in just a moment to maybe d1 or e1, depending on which file is more important. So why would white allow this to happen? Why allow your rook to be inconvenienced like this? Well, let's consider doing something else. Uh, you know, if you don't want to allow bishop takes bishop and your rook be inconvenienced, you would take here. But there's some drawbacks with that as well. These doubled pawns are not a liability. The e6 pawn would provide some nice cover to d5. The knight on c3 is not uh, enjoying its position as much. And the rook would also be brought to life. So one way or the other, black is, you know, going to be helped in some way. It's either you're going to have a inconvenienced rook, like in the game, or you're going to no longer have d5 for your knight, and you're going to help out the rook on f8. White prefers, clearly, to have the rook slightly inconvenienced. E5 has some pressure on it. What does black do? Is now the moment to release the tension in the center and make this capture? No. Black is not so quick to give up this stronghold in the center, the E5 pawn, that furthest advanced pawn in the center. Rook E8 is in. The E pawn is defended indirectly. What follows is rook to A1, immediately getting this rook back into the ball game. I mean, he's okay, he's on a closed file, but he's much more active on a1 than he is a2. If, instead of rook to a1, white tries to go pawn hunting, this is not a pawn you can hang on to. As an example, after a queen exchange, we can have bishop d6, the knight is hit twice. If he is defended, well, there are multiple ways to get the pawn back. Like this, maybe like that, 
or instead of f4 if the knight runs away that's the other way to get the e-pawn back and not only what is happening with this variation I'm showing not only do we have uh, material being restored but now that it has opened up this rook is super awkward you don't want as white the position to open up like this and have one of your pieces caught on the a2 square it's just not a good idea so that's why we have white not go in for these capturing sequences not only because you're not winning material at the end of it all but yeah that awkward piece on a2 you should probably get him right back in the ball game rook a1 it is this main tension uh this tension in the center is maintained knight c4 this knight is looking for a new square black knows he can be kicked at any moment with b3 the main intention is not to reinforce e5 he can be kicked at any moment and he wouldn't be there anymore to defend e5 the main idea is to reposition to b6 and he's better placed on b6 than he is a5 observing at least uh, one of the key central squares rook to e1 small improvements in this game a lot of small improvements going on getting all the pieces involved little by little rook to c8 not yet committing the c pawn maybe c6 maybe c5 black keeps those options open both sides now on this move 15 say let's get a flight square in and now the knight is kicked knight b6 bishop b2 some pressure it's indirect but it's there there's some pressure against e5 now with the bishop bishop f8 e5 is defended directly and now what how do you improve further there's been a lot of maneuvering going on only one piece exchange light square bishop's gone what to do now when i was reviewing this game live right around this position i was saying how do you move you know what what move choices do you have here for white how do you improve further and i went through this whole position piece by piece do you move this pawn i mean what are you gaining by moving this pawn this guy here i mean all of these pieces i'm highlighting they either can't move or moving them is not helping everything here if you make a move with them it's not helping you so really this position is coming down to doing something with this guy or the queen we can have in this position queen to d2 preparing to double up or what happened in the game and that is d takes e5 now if queen to d2 was played in this position how might play follow knight b to d7 getting him to a point where he's controlling e5 and suppose white gets this rook in the ball game we can now have c6 and it's a position now where the white rooks are central but black is able to maintain this e5 point this knight is under control by this pawn and because of that the bishop is also under control it's tough to see a great uh, breakthrough here black is holding on to that key point d5 and the queen is now free to come out along this diagonal it's tough to see where there's some good forward progress white could make from this position there's only a couple more uh pieces to get involved in, at this point the queen and the rook but once you get to that point how do you make progress there really isn't great progress to be made so this is where white takes some action and this move 18 decides to only at this point release the tension in the center that has been present for several moves now d takes e d takes e a4 things are opening up now in the center some on the queen side now a4 c6 this is uh an interesting moment you don't want to make this capture because you now have isolated pawns this is a very important pawn the center pawn of these two structures you don't want to lose them without the b pawn white has isolated pawns without both b pawns right 
you would have isolated pawns. So they're very important. You don't want to give up the B pawn for the A pawn. So instead, we have C6. Now I must admit, when I was viewing this game, I thought, well, on A4, what's wrong with B4? I said, the knight is certainly going to move forward, right? You're not going to go in reverse. But one of the best moves in this position is to play knight to A2. The issue with playing B4 is that you give up the C4 square. This is something I didn't appreciate, and uh, I wanted to share this with you. The giving up the C4 square is a big deal. Black has cover with a piece, but that's not a piece you can maintain there. And white is not long off from occupying the c4 square. The knight, it is true, on a2 is inconvenienced, but giving up the c4 square, that's a big deal. Computer prefers team white here by what's close to 0.4. I know that that's not much, but it's certainly much more than uh, what we saw for the bulk of this game. Okay, b4 was not played. c6 instead. Maintaining the b5 pawn, not allowing white to key in on the c4 square, and it controls d5 and b5 still. This knight on c3 is under control, and because he is under control, the bishop on b2 does not see the world. So this is an important moment. c6 is a strong move. Queens are now exchanged. The yay file is opened up. And now the knight is repositioning. e5 is hit twice. Um, what might be tempting at this moment, instead of the move played in the game, knight to e2, it may be tempting to make a rook move, right? This is a completely open file. What's wrong with rook to a6? You're hitting the knight, and if he moves, you're getting the c6 pawn. Well, he doesn't have to move. I just want to illustrate how this temporary uh, activity of the white rook on a6 can be neutralized. If rook a6 was played, knight f to d7 can follow, doing two things, primary one to defend the knight, but also black is now in a position to have a pawn reinforce the e5 pawn, and black is now prepared to challenge the a6 rook. Suppose white doubles rooks, black can still go here, and we could quickly see both rooks exchange. This knight that's in the corner, that is not a great inconvenience in this minor piece specific ending. It's a roughly equal position here. So only temporarily, uh, it's just temporary, a very, very temporary activity if uh, rook to a6 is played. It'll be offset in short order. In this game, knight e2 is played, bishop b4, many interesting options here. Uh, one variation I was playing around with, I don't want to go into uh, many of the variations, I just want to highlight one that I found interesting, and that was, should black go in for knight takes e, and bishop takes e, knight d2 had some fun looking at uh, this variation. I thought knight to d2 as a follow-up would be pretty good, but not so much. Notice this move, bishop to c7. Who is getting the better of this one? Knight takes knight? G takes? Oh, you don't want that to happen to your kingside structure, do you? And now... Is there a way out of this fork? Well, there is. Rook to d2. I was, I was thinking that this was bad for white to allow this variation, but let's carry it out a little bit more. What ends up happening at the end of this variation is, even though this structure is ruined, rook a8. This bishop is pinned, and how do you get out of the pin? Bishop c5 is threatened. You can stop that for a move with rook takes c, but after b4, the bishop will not be denied the c5 square. The best that black can do right around here is give up the rook like this, get out of the pin, hunt down the pawn, and try to hold on 
in this ending, which may very well turn out to be a draw, but you don't want to, uh, you definitely don't want to go in for this variation. But I found it interesting. Things can certainly turn quite lively if there's, uh, if the e-pawns are captured. We didn't have that. Uh, something much more calm. Well, it is throwing a punch, but it's not getting that volatile, let's just say. Bishop b4. That bishop is offset. Bishops are gone. All knights remain on board. Both rooks on board. The knight is there to reinforce e5. Rook a6, rook c8 to defend. b4. Two things in mind with that move. To not only secure the knight on c3, but also control the c5 square, right? There won't be any b4 by black, and there won't be any knight c5 move now. Rook to e6. Uh, black can, at this point, play c5. This comes one move later, after uh, rook to e6. But uh, white could, or excuse me, black can play c5 right now. Just want to highlight one more variation here. If c5 is played, knight takes b5, c takes b4. Is black falling for a fork? Well, yeah, it is a fork, but rook e6. And if knight takes rook, rook takes rook, it remains a level position. We don't have that. In the game, rook e6 first. Rook to b1, one of the top moves by the engine. Stockfish at least, stockfish 7. This is preparing uh, to meet a c5 pawn break. That still hits. Rook takes e6. These pawns are doubled. Something that white can take advantage of. Let's see. Knight takes b. c takes b. Rook takes b, rook takes c, all the queenside pawns are gone, the attention now turns towards the king's side. How exactly to take advantage of the only thing that really sticks out in this position, these doubled pawns? It can be quite tricky, as we know, both players with still two knights. Let's see how play follows. Knight d6, and now rook c1, king h2. Rook c2, king g1, and the players agree to a draw. <laughs> uh, it could have maybe gone on for a little bit more, uh, but yeah, no, pretty much a little bit of an abrupt end to this one. There really wasn't too much more to fight for here. I know that during the game, I was saying, you know, if we had at some point the rooks exchanged and a couple pawns exchanged, there is always this idea where you can possibly sacrifice both of your knights for your opponent's remaining pawns. Should it arrive at a position where it is your king versus your opponent's king and two knights, your opponent cannot win that position by force. So, and I mean, as it is right now, black can't not really try for something. I don't feel that black would be justified Team Black here, Carlson, I don't feel he would be justified in trying to press this one, having uh, the worst structure. It's uh, another very accurate game. Let's have a quick look, a little bit of a, <laughs> a tale of the tape once more. If you caught game one, you may think that, am I using the same graph? Um, no, I'm not. This is an entirely different game, but we are once again seeing a flat line for this one. And all the stats that you see just to the right here, once more, zero inaccuracies, zero mistakes, zero blunders for both sides, with an average centipon loss of four. Now, someone in the last video asked about this centipon. The number four represents basically four hundredths of a uh, four hundredths of a pawn. So this centipon loss, on average, uh, 
this is how how much the evaluation goes down uh, with each of the moves these guys are playing. It's only going down on average by 0 0.04. Okay, it's not varying much. These guys are playing very accurate chess, as can be seen here with this graph that uh, uses Stockfish to uh, do its number crunching. Very accurate play so far in these first two games of the championship. There is a rest day uh, in between game two and three. We will see what happens when they come back from their rest day. Uh, game three is next. This match remains level. One point apiece. We'll see what happens. And as usual, feel free to leave any feedback in the comment section below. And I will catch you for game three. That's all for now. Take care. Bye.